Good day everyone and welcome to our webinar today on this topic of concept design of road and drainage infrastructure. My name is Peter Coombs and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce you to my colleagues joining me on the webinar today and that's Roy Wong and Max Anderson who are both from the engineering department and they'll be running the live demos with me a little bit later during the course of this presentation. We're still getting quite a few people logging in, so I'll make a quiet start and we'll look at an introduction and the agenda for the webinar today whilst everyone's settling into their seats. We'll run through a brief introduction and look at some case studies and understand the challenges that we're facing when it comes to infrastructure design before moving on to the live demonstration. So the introduction only take five to ten minutes max. And what we're looking at really, when we come to designing infrastructure, we're really relating to these local roads, um, estate road kind of projects. We're going to show you how you can design very quickly and easily uh, a road layout, and then also look at different options and scenarios on how we can tackle the drainage uh, based on trying to satisfy the client, but also the approving authorities. To run through the concept process, we've established this particular process and I've highlighted in red determining the road geometry in, in sort of fourth iteration down. In reality, it doesn't work out that way. Uh, what I'd ideally like people to do is gather data, assess the catchment pre-development. So let's look at the land. Let's look at where the existing blue-green corridors exist, uh, the existing hydrology of that catchment, before we can start determining viable outfalls in terms of the drainage system. And then we should really be determining in the road geometry to best fit in with that. Now, in reality, what happens is that what we find with feedback from the industry is that the information is gathered. We have a topography. That topography is provided to probably an architect who will then generate a layout for you know, a housing estate to maximize the value from that land. And then they're basically told, well, now get on and design it and, and make it work. Were there any kind of initial work that's been taking place and this is where we need to maybe change the way we do things a little bit it's not doing any much more work or more effort it's just getting the right sequence in place i'll run through this first challenge and that is we have a ground survey we have a layout i'm now going to design a, a road layout i'll hand that over to roy and say here you go roy make the drainage work and we've got a client that has got a, a ground worker working in a traditional manner, so pipes, manholes, down to some kind of a, an online attenuation tank and uh, an online control before discharging offsite. So it's the sort of typical way we've been doing things for quite a while. We don't have the uh, full detail on the site, and we're looking at potentially being in a clay soil until we get results from a soil investigation. So looking at the case studies, why do we need to do this? The main reason behind it is because we've been experiencing globally extreme rainfall events and those rainfall events are generating increasing amounts of runoff. You can argue whether this is climate change or not, but the reality is we're experiencing more frequent rainfall events and uh, more extreme rainfall events. The photograph here is of Thatcham in 2007. So this is July 2007, uh, the summertime in the UK where people were, were advised to come and collect their children from school in these vehicles, and the vehicles are being washed down what appear to be two rivers, but they're actually the, the road system. So the reason why we're putting together the, the conceptual design between road and drainage is that they are inextricably connected. So when we have these extreme events, the roads will become conduits. They will become rivers. So we need to m mitigate against this right from the outset and think about the surface water management before we even start uh, designing the highway and the drainage systems to serve them. With this particular case study, what one of the key things that came out of it is this is not river flooding. And we've been very focused on the extent of river flooding in our existing catchments, but this is pure extreme overland runoff. This is pluvial flooding. And this is what we're finding increasingly common globally, uh, particularly in the area that we cover, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa from here in, in Newbury. So the artificial drainage systems, they have a limited capacity, as does everything, um, but also you need to be mindful of the maintenance. And this is one, one area where 
Uh, and in this particular case, we, we had a trash screen fitted onto a very important outfall pipe, and that was A, badly constructed in the first place, but B, not maintained. So it would not have mitigated the flooding, but the flooding inundation would have abated a lot quicker. We would have been underwater for a lot shorter period of time. So that's looking at sort of temperate climates. If we look across at the arid countries, uh, we've been experiencing increasing amounts of flooding uh, in the Middle East, for example. So I've just come back from a, a trip and met some really good people over the last couple of weeks. And I know that a lot of, of, have logged in today as well. So hi, folks. Nice to be in touch with you still. Um, but top left-hand corner, this is a super cyclone that hit the Oman in 2007. And this is showing two wadis that are in full flow. We had many people draining in the Oman as a result of that super cyclone. Even two weeks ago, there was a cyclone called Chapala uh, that hit uh, Yemen and deposited 500 millimeters of rainfall, 500 millimeters of rainfall in two days in areas where they typically get 50 millimeters of rainfall in just a whole year. And these are the kind of areas, if you look here, we're in Saudi Arabia, flooding of underpasses, major highway schemes have gone in. Um, it didn't rain in Saudi in, in this area for about 20 years, but now it's raining kind of every year. Um, the rainfall would be no more than about 80 or 90 millimeters in, in a year, but we're getting that in a day, uh, often the case. And here, where people are being swept off their feet and a lot of loss of life. We're learning the lessons really hard, and, and the key lesson I feel is that we need to work better with nature. And those lessons are being learned globally, and there are specifications, standards, guidance documents, all coming through to better make the use of the space. Now, th this is a contentious space uh, point because I know that taking up room is a, is a real thorny issue. Land values are extremely high, and we can't afford uh, to just keep them as open land. But there are areas of public open space that are requirements of planning laws, etc. And what people are doing, this is over in Dubai, actually, but here they're mapping out these blue-green corridors and, and keeping them open. So we're providing better, uh, multiple benefit. This isn't just about the drainage. It's improving the biodiversity. Uh, we're looking at improving the, the water quality, rushing off and going through these natural systems. And we're also looking at providing amenities, reducing the heat and providing amenities, parklands, walkways, etc., for people. So the bottom right hand photograph here is showing a kind of a development that we're going to tackle with a live demo shortly. So we've got a, a highway scheme here and then a lot of little junctions and lots. Uh, in this case, they've managed to, to build in a nice green space right in the middle. Uh, we don't have that luxury. I'm going to carry out in accordance with the first challenge, and that is, here's the land, here's the road layout, make it work. Those documents coming through, and by, and by the way, in terms of the UK, there are a lot of people listening in from the UK. Um, the Making Space for Water document, I mean, this came out in March of 2005, so it's over a decade ago, and the Interim Code of Practice for Sustainable Drainage Systems um, was, was 11 years ago. I'm really pleased to, to say that the local authority SEDS officer organization have pr produced some really robust best practice guidance document on uh, sustainable drainage. And tomorrow uh, is the launch of the new SEDS manual that Syria have produced and a, a major emphasis on biodiversity, water quality uh, and amenity, as well as water quantity, addressing that balance. So it's, it's all good news. The other good news is we've got the tools to enable you to manage this quite easily. So I'm going to start off. We'll do the live demonstrations now, and I'll start off with XP Site 3D Create a Road Layout. I'll then uh, hand that over to Roy, uh, and Roy's got a client who's looking at a traditional drainage option, so pipes and manholes. So I'll, I'll create that in XP Site 3D, hand over to Roy, bring it into microdrainage, and create the the drainage design for us at a kind of concept stage so that we can get a, an approval or not, as the case may be with the approving authorities. We'll see if we can get some results from the soil investigation that's going going on right now and see if we can infiltrate or not and hand over to Max, who's going to use the MD SEDS software to create a sustainable drainage option to compare with the traditional option that Roy's got. So that we can we can take that to the client, see if we can save him some money, encourage him to look at the uh, the, the new way forward 
uh, and also satisfying the approving authorities in the bargain as well. That's our challenge today. I'm going to go live with the software, and let's take a look at um, XP Site 3D. So what I've done with XP Site 3D, you can see this is a, a plan view, and I've imported the terrain. So you just fi file and open and file import 3D CAD drawings or terrain models, uh, whether you've got a land survey or a 3D CAD drawing. Bring those in. I've draped the CAD drawing just over the uh, surface. And what I'd like to do is just show you how, how you can quickly produce your highway network. You can see there are quite a few junctions in here. We've got a roundabout. These are the kind of areas that people have been mentioning to me. They're so difficult, not difficult, but they just take time and they're fiddly to do. So what I'll do, I'll zoom in and let me just create um, just a junction up here with, with the two highways. And on the top, top toolbar, we have uh, something called centerline tools. And the plan here is just to identify the center line of the highway. We don't really have to do it this way, but I think it's a good way to, to go about the, the process. We can identify the center line of the, of the carriageways, and then we can apply a profile of the carriageway to then create the road system that'll be draped upon the existing surface. So I'm now gonna just click on new center line. We have a, a range of tools up here. We, we can snap to vertices, we can snap to arcs, so if I start at the left-hand side and, and work across to the right, I'm going to move across and then select the arcs along this center line. So I don't have to sort of click every single iteration as I go along the highway. So I'm just left-clicking as I go along, come down the highway, and there's a third arc here. I can switch back to a vertice and then click as I approach the roundabout situation, and then right-click and, and finish. So I've now established the center line of a, of a carriageway. And uh, what I want to do now is create another road that's going to connect with it with a junction. So let me just click on the junction here and right click and finish. So now we have two center lines established with the TPs for, for, for the arc shown here. I can now apply the profile of the highway. <clears throat> we have a measuring uh, tool, so I could use the tools and measure the line, measure the width of the carriageway here. I can tell you it's 7.3 meters wide, and this one's five meters wide. So what I'll do is set the profile of the highway with the channels, the curbs, if they have them. And, and you can see from the CAD drawing, we have a footpath, 1.8 meter wide footpath uh, with, with a crossfall. So clicking on the channels and curves, I'll do the larger road first. It makes no odds which way around I do this, but I'll, I'll just click on the larger road. And now we can set up the profile. The width, as I mentioned, is 3.65 for each of the carriageways, 7.3 meter width in, in total. So we can create left and right side um, channels if they are different offset. But I want to put a 1 in 40 cross for and replicate that on either side. Uh, we've got the left curb, we've got the left footway. This information is all fine. So we're going to have a crane in the road, a single carriageway, each 3.65 meters width at a 1 in 40 cross fall, then we have an upstand curb, and then we have a 1 in 40 cross fall negative away from the highway with the footpath. And I'll say OK to that, and that there's my highway draped upon the surface, and I can do the same thing again for the, the side road that's coming in. Except this time, it's only 5 metres wide, so each carriageway would be 2.5. I could pick on either side. You can see there's a pick option here, but I'll just say OK. And now recognizing that these two center lines are coming together, the program saying, oh, okay, do, do you want to create a junction? I could say no, um, but I like the idea of creating the junction. And looking at the plan view here, you can see that it's automatically set the radii to six meters. I could manually change that and make it 16 meters if I wanted to, but actually six meters is good. I'll leave that at six and say, OK, create the junction. And that's now taken place. Whilst I've been doing this, the program, if I click on the layers, has been triangulating for me. So if I click on road triangulation, just say OK, you can now see that all of the triangulation of that interconnected junction has, has taken place. And this seems to be the kind of key issue that people are struggling with, creating these junctions stitching them together, making it all work, adding in roundabouts. So what I'll do now, show you how, it easy, how easy it is to move and, and edit these things. If I just click on the 
the move tool. Maybe the architect's changed his mind. Do they ever? Um, never, I'm sure. But maybe he's moved his, changed his mind. He wants to move the junction a little bit there. Um, I'm, I'm just dragging and moving the road around. And it's retriangulating live as I do that. So it's not a big deal. What I like to do now is turn off the triangulation. So I'll quit that command and then turn off the triangulation. Say okay to that. And now I'm going to put in another change. So may maybe we could load in another CAD drawing. I'm not going to worry about doing that right now, but I could swap the CAD drawing because maybe the architect has changed his, his layout and this is going to be a roundabout. How do I create a roundabout? Well, I go back to my channel tools, establish the center line of road number three that will come up and, and connect. So I'll just establish the center line, right click, finish, and then apply the profile. So I'll click on my center line that I've established. Remember that the road width is 2.5, is five meter side road. So okay to that. And now the program's identified that this is two roads coming together, and that means we potentially want to create a roundabout. Otherwise, we just have one road rather than uh, two separate ones. I can change the information here and maybe go from a 16 meter, when, when you do crazy things like putting a, a 206 meter diameter roundabout, it says, you've got to be kidding me. And I can add in uh, an island diameter. So I've created the roundabout, made it 20 meters diameter, not the 16 meters that it was um, creating for me. And I can change the diameter of the island. I'll make that zero and it'll go, hang on a minute, you've got to be kidding me. You can have an island at zero diameter. So let's put it in at um, 10 meter diameter and put an apron in the center or around the island of, of one meter, for example. So all of these options, we're trying to empower the highways design team to enable you to acquire and satisfy the layout, whatever that may be and whatever changes the architect comes out with. If I say okay to that, I've now created a roundabout. And of course the architect turns around and says, well, hang on a minute, I want, it, I want it shifting in like half a meter to the right or, you know, 600 mil to the left or whatever. Well, we can, we can move the roundabout around as well. And it's, as you move that around, we retriangulate and reprofile everything. So in true Blue Peter fashion, I could go through and do the rest of the network for you. But what I'll do is I'll just open up one that I've done earlier. And this is now showing me on plan all of the road network. It's got the roundabout in the right place. He's finished changing his mind. Um, put a pond in here. If I put on a, a height map, uh, just to see where the high ground and where the low ground is. If I hover my mouse over the left-hand side, we're looking at about 46 meters above datum. And on the right-hand side in the blue, we're down at sort of 33. So we've got about 13 meters of crossfall from the west across to the east. So the outfall for the drainage system should be located across towards the eastern side of the site. So we're going to find out whether we're connecting into a river, connecting into an existing sewer, whatever that may be. So we can start identifying the outfall positions and switch off that height map. And what I've done is use the drainage tool to design the layout of the surface water and the foul water drainage systems. And that's what you can see on the road profiles here. So if I just zoom in a little bit, you'll see um, S17, F14. So manhole uh, S for stormwater, 17 and manhole F. 16 for the foul water system. So there are two row, uh, drainage layouts, traditional drainage layouts already provided. Back to the highway design part of things, something that I'm often asked is, uh, can we contour the highway? So if I go back to the centerline channel tools, I can click on contours, set those. In this case, I've set to 50 mil intervals and say, okay. So that's the, um, the, the, the highway contours automatically for you at 50 mil intervals you can change it to, to suit uh, just to answer that question that people may be thinking as i'm as i'm going along uh, i'll turn that off switch off the visuals and say okay we can output changes and cross sections and all that kind of stuff as well the other thing is when we put in the drainage system uh, we're often asked the question well what about the gullies can we add in the gully positions so within the drainage design tool there is a gully positioning to 
options so I can show show the gullies. I had them hidden, but now you can see the gully locations connecting into the stormwater networks. So they're they're all applied based on the square meters of requirement to put the gully in the right spot. And I can hide them. If I just come back out, all I would do now is having completed this exercise, you've now got a, a reprofiled DTM with, with, with the highway put in a pond as well. What I would do is save this out. So just go to file and uh, save as. In terms of the plans, you can save out in, in CAD formats. You can save out to Google Earth and locate that on Google Earth if you wanted to. Drainage wise, we can export the storm and the foul water networks as an MDX. Um, you could send out uh, individual stormwater or foul water network as well. And in terms of the finishes, uh, the surfaces, you can export in a variety of formats to, to create DTMs and bring them, for example, into micro drainage. I've exported the, the model in a PWF format for Roy to utilize and I've exported the micro drainage, drainage networks for Roy to design in micro drainage using the MDX format. So, Roy's challenge, if I just go back to the slideshow really quickly, your challenge in terms of the stormwater network right now is that we need to design this as a traditional system because the client really favors traditional systems. We need to make sure there's no surcharging for a one in one year return period, uh, create a network with no flooding uh, and restrict the discharge uh, off of off of the site in accordance with the interim code of practice for sustainable drain systems IH124. So you need to restrict the discharge off the site with a flow control. That would then mean flooding if you didn't have a, a structure in place. So we, you need to add in a storage structure and a flow control to make sure there's no flooding for the 30 year return period uh, and allowing a freeboard of a half a meter below the ground. Um, we're trying to encourage the client to think a little bit more sustainably even with his tr traditional drainage system so if we if we have the space can we put a pond there rather than an underground storage tank and this is all for the concept design laterally we need we'll need to check for overland flooding for the 100 year and manage that flooding to make sure that we do protect people and we do protect properties into the future the challenge really is going to be looking at the discharge rates and the discharge volume. At the minute, we believe that this is a clay soil. We're waiting for the soil investigation report to come back. We are going to have to assume worst case scenario that the volume of discharge post development is going to be greater than the pre development volume. So we're going to be restricted to the Q bar figure. So at that, I'll hand over to Roy to show us how we can design our traditional drainage system a concept. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Peter. Right, before we carry out the drainage design, we'll, uh, we should have an overall picture about our development site. So you see the site where there's recreation ground at the middle of the development site and then surrounded by the residential buildings here. So it's very useful to have understanding about the overall ground profile. So let me turn on the height map. The high ground is, uh, is straight in pink and the lower ground is straight in blue. So it's quite obvious that the surface runoff will flow from the west to east. And it's very likely we'll put the drainage outlet at the east side of the, drain, uh, of the development site. What we can do with those uh, very useful ground data, micro drainage features and another very cool function is flood flow. We can use flood flow analysis to simulate a to simulate a rainfall on a grid. Um, in this case, we put a 15 millimeter depth of water on a grid and then simulate the model for 60 minutes. And you can set the grid size here. And in this case, we use four meter grid size as good enough for to uh, for a preliminary design to understand the where would be the local uh, sink point or flood spot. So, and for the time being, I've already run the flood flow. Let me turn off the height map and turn on the flood flow depth. So from the result, you can see that there's a uh, locally flood spot at, at the east side of the, uh, at the east side. And it's a very useful information for the engineer and architect before they carry out the layout or the drainage design. They need to put 
they should either decide to change uh, some additional flood pre- uh, prevention uh, measures or just simply raise up the ground levels here. All right. Okay, we have already have a basic understanding of, of this site. Let's move on to the drainage network design. With the MDX file provided by Peter, then we have a, a layout of our drainage network here now. And what we should do, of course, the catchment areas. With micro drainage drawn F function, it's very handy to define a catchment area. You just drag and draw. Like you can draw the catchment area on the plan view and then the micro drainage will calculate the area for you. And the next thing we should do is decide the antenation structures and the flow control. In micro drainage, we have another, two, we have the tool boss. You can simply use the drag and drop functions here. For example, if I want to put a antenation structure here, I'll just uh, drag and drop it here. Uh, uh, well, in this case, I'm not gonna go into the, going through the design process. So, same for the online control and offline control, you can still use the drag and drop functions. Let's go through the details inside for, for the tank. I've already put a entering structures at the east side of the development sites. So, um, if I go to the network and pawn, you can see the, the details of this poem. We can use the depth area diagram to define the shape of the uh, engineering structures. And microgenic features are uh, more than 10 types of uh, commonly used uh, engineering structures in the, in the models. In this case, I just use pawn, uh, which is the simplest one. And because we don't have the soil condition information, I don't. We just assume it will be the worst scenario, all the soil is clay, there will be no infiltration. So I don't use any infiltration uh, and tuning structures here. Okay, then let's have a look at the control. Under network drawdown, we have uh, online control and offline control. In this case, I use online control. Hydro brake was used. Why use hydro brake? It's the very common one uh, to be used in the industry and it's very simple, effective, and easy to maintenance. And in the settings, we can set the design, high, design head and the uh, design flow. So um, I'm not going into detail about how to design a flow control and the engineering structure because we have already covered in the part five of this webinar series. I would like to put more time about, well, we finished the design, what we should do next, simulation. Yeah, um, what Michael Jane can do is not only just simulation, we check the model for you. Um, we have a function called the design audit wizard, uh, in Michael Jane If I want the design audit wizard, you can set the range of cover level, bed draw, and also full ball velocity for checking purpose. And then you can select the, uh, wing for storm. In this case, we use FSR wing for storm and both uh, summer and winter. Also, the rainfall durations and the compliance criteria to the return period. To the return period, for example, we check the surcharge for one year return period, check flooding for thirty years return period, uh, which I've already listed in the PowerPoint. We just said uh, these are our design criteria. Please check it. And then it was the most important things. They would like to check compliance to the ICP for SUS. Here you can set the um, greenfield discharge rate for one year, 30 years, and 100 years. Because we don't have the infiltration on site, and it's very likely that the discharge volume will be larger than the developed discharge volume will be larger than the greenfield def- uh, discharge volume. So uh, we, our discharge rate will be bound by Q bar and Q1, uh, which is the one year return period greenfield discharge rate. All right. I've done all the settings, let's run the research. And for the time being, I've already run it. Normally this uh, checking part, uh, the simulation will just to take two minutes, but yeah, I just want to save time. So let's go to the results. Here's the result. The research checked various items uh, for us, uh, which include the manhole size, the charge flooding, and also the ICP, all these things, which already covered nearly all the things that the approval authority, they, they are interested in. And 
if you have noticed that there's two failure, failed items, one is the charge, we can go in to the detail, have a look. Uh, on the tree view on the right hand side, we click the charge. And it says that the pi number 1.004 have a surcharge more than 600 millimeter. So where's the location of pi 1.004? Let's have a look at in the long session. 1.004 here. And the pi is at the outlet of antinuing structures. It's no surprise that the antinuing structure is surcharged. So this one is totally fine. Uh, totally fine for us because um, the surcharge is not happening at the uh, outlet pi, it's happening in the antinuing structures. So let's have a look at the result again. And there's another fa fail at ICP audit. So um, for the failed items, um, it will be highlighted in red. It says that the discharge volume of the development site is higher than the Greenfield discharge volume. Well, it's actually proving our assumption at the very beginning. That's why the discharge rate will be bounded by Q bar and Q1. And our dis currently discharge rate is less than the Q bar and also the Q1. So all in all, this design is, is successful. One more thing to go on is would be the storage volume. If we have a look at the volume summary, we can see that the storage volume in the antinuing structure is about uh, 2,500 cu uh, cubic meter, and cut off all those free balls and extra things. Uh, I think the effective uh, storage volume will be 1,500. So uh, if you do mark down this number, and later on, uh, Matt will compare the storage volume with the uh, sub-strainage system. Now I'll pass to Matt to go one to the sub-strainage system. Cheers, Roy. As Royce correctly sort of pointed out, that's your traditional design approach. But I'm going to show you now a more sustainable approach where we're going to try and deal with the water um, sort of closer towards the subcatchment areas that, uh, that Roy pointed out uh, and in a joined up uh, sort of way so that uh, we can try and look to make use of some new information which has just come through the door. We've got that soil report back uh, and we have found that actually we're not in a clay soil. Uh, we're in a soil. Uh, where we've got an infiltration coefficient of about 0.1 meters per hour that we're going to try and look uh, to make use of as well. And I'm going to guide you through this process uh, using our brand new module, uh, MD SUDS. You'll see immediately we work around a plan view, uh, which is great to be able to see and visualize all the information that's coming in. And if we try and follow uh, along the top here, you'll see a design process ribbon and if we try and work from the left to the right, this will help guide us through the design process. Uh, so to begin with, I can bring in the surface data that Peter's generated with our highway profiles in XP Site 3D and the CAD data from the architect. I could also choose if I wanted to, to load a background image so that I could see exactly what my site is gonna look like. For my rainfall here, we've been uh, assuming we're working on a site in the UK. So we've been using some FSR data. I know some of you in the UK, uh, the local authorities are wanting to use uh, FEH. And then we've got ARR for those of you, Australasia, uh, and SCS as well. So we've really got lots of different options. And of course, you could bring in your own. Perhaps you've observed some rainfall. You could bring those records in uh, as well. But if I just open up the rainfall manager and I can show you, uh, I've got three sets of storms uh, designed. Obviously, 30 years, I'm going to be concerned about my flooding. And 100 years, Roy's already made mention of it, but the ICP SUDS uh, requirement uh, for the greenfield and post-development discharge volumes, that's going to become very important when looking to use the infiltration structures. I've also got a tab here for pollutant data. I could enter some pollutant data uh, if I wanted to, although we're not going to cover that um, today. Uh, but obviously, the advantage of using substructures is that we can try and provide some incre uh, some betterment in our water quality before discharging off site, uh, especially from areas where we get pollutant buildup, such as highways. I'll skip that for today uh, and I'll come on to the design tools. Uh, so with this new soils report that we've got, I'm going to have to recalculate uh, my some of my site parameters. Uh, so this is all the pre-development pre stuff. I'm not 
starting any of the design process. I want to be in full possession of the knowledge. Uh, and you can see here that we're, we're assuming we're region six. Uh, so our QBAR um, and then our, our Q, Q1, Q30 and Q100 values have changed quite significantly. So I would be limited to, uh, uh, to 6.5 litres per second if I was following Roy's sort of approach and I knew that my uh, discharge volume was uh, post-development was greater than pre-development. But I'm going to try and uh, not have that. I'm going to try and use uh, to gain parity with my Q1, Q30 uh, and Q100 uh, discharge rates there that you can see. Uh, the other thing, the very important thing that we need to check is this greenfield runoff volume. Uh, and you can see here that it's 650 cubic meters. So if you just bear that figure in mind, 650 cubic meters will be when we test for the 100 year return period of that six hour winter storm. We need to make sure that we're discharging less than that volume if we are to obtain parity with our pre-development runoff rates. So another thing that we want to know is roughly how much storage we might be looking to add to, to this. It's going to help us at the conceptual design stage. Uh, so you can see I've added in the 30 year criteria because I want to design to cope with my flooding or to prevent my flooding. So there's my Q30 rate in here. I've got my site area of approximately three hectares and I've added in my infiltration coefficient. So if I just click calculate there, you can see how fast the program's able to generate these values. Uh, and if I wasn't using infiltration, I'd have to provide some storage approximately around the similar level of storage that Roy was providing through the traditional design method of about 1,500 cubic meters. But you can see if I, if I use infiltration structures uh, in my storage, uh, I could actually get away with significantly reducing, reducing by more than half the amount of storage in my system uh, that I would need. So I'm going to look just for my conceptual design. Uh, I'm going to look at adding about 700 cubic meters to the design and we'll see where that leaves us with the ability to use infiltration. Hopefully this will prove effective and we can then pass this on to the client and say, well, look, uh, we can give you such a such a great cost saving uh, rather than having to excavate. I think it was about 2500 cubic meters to provide the pond space. We could get away with something. Uh, perhaps much, much less than that. So the final design tool that we want to do, uh, Roy's already used it in, in traditional micro drainage, uh, but it's to apply a deluge to our site. Now I've already got this uh, set up here. I can turn on with the tree view manager my deluge. If I just take off uh, the hazard uh, arrows, which are useful to determine the direction, but we already know that from our height information. And you can see again, We've got the areas of pooling here that we that we need to be aware of uh, and everything's draining from the west down to the east. So looking at this, then some initial thoughts of, of where could I put some structures? Well, we've got higher ground up here towards the northwest of the site. We might be concerned that actually this is this is some impermeable area. This is already developed and we want we're concerned about surface runoff from here uh, coming into our site and giving us flooding, which yeah, it's not rained here, but we're going to have to deal with it. So we might want to apply perhaps a swale, a sort of a protective swale around this edge of our site. And likewise, if we do get any flooding or any excess surface runoff, uh, we don't want to be moving this on to, to somebody else down downstream, essentially down here to the southeast. Uh, so you might want some swales in here to collect any of that rainwater. And you can see down here where my outfall is, it, it, the water is naturally wanting to flow this way. So if I consider that when I'm setting up my connections, um, that's going to really help me out. So without further ado, I can move over towards building and, and, and thinking about building some of these structures. Uh, and to do this, first of all, I need to consider the subcatchments. Well, I've got two options here. I could draw them onto my CAD like Roy did, or actually I can import the ones that Roy made for me. Uh, already is either CAD or GIS data. So if I just switch those on, you'll see I've brought them straight into MD SUDS. So the drainage systems then, uh, we've got a lot of different types of drainage system that we might want to consider doing. Again, very easy. I could either bring them in from CAD or GIS data to define their shapes, or alternatively, I can just click about here and draw it onto my, uh, onto my data. You'll see there have been four others that have popped up already. 
So I'm just going to discard this one and show you the ones that I actually went for when I was considering this design. The architect had already identified some of these hatched areas as being being areas where the, the traffic flow might be such that actually we can, we can get away. We want to use some porous paving around these areas. And then again, for reasons that I've just mentioned, I've employed two swales here. And then from this swale, I'm going to I'm going to control my outflow offsite uh, here. So to bring up um, some of the details, I just hover over my site and double click. Um, you can see that from the ability that I have already drawn these onto the CAD and surface data, and it picks up some of that information already to define my swale. Uh, but actually, I made a mistake. I, I, my base width, I wanted to specify myself. So I can go in here uh, and I can change any of these parameters and variables as I see fit. One of the things that we noticed, we were getting a lot of feedback about some of you guys are going into the help try and you'd like to see more pictures. So this is really handy if you're explaining to a client or the architect as well exactly what the parameters are meaning. So we've included a sketch with each of the uh, each of the SUDS structures. And yeah, it's a good aid memoir just to make sure you know you're entering exactly the right information where you need to. We could also set information about uh, the ability to reduce pollutants as well. But as I said, just to save time, I'm not going into that. Uh, at the minute. So if I look at my advanced sort of options, you can see I've entered a base infiltration rate using using my coefficient. Uh, I'm not having any side infiltration in, in my trench, but you can see down here I, I've specified a horizontal retention time for the swale. Uh, and Peter's already made mention of, of the new SUDS document that's coming out tomorrow. Uh, and you'll see in there um, that we've got this new requirement that we should be taking about nine minutes for the water to be retained whilst flowing through our swale. So I've added that in in there. The final thing now that I've decided, designed some structures, I've got some rainfall, I've got some catchment areas, uh, is to link it all together. You can do this using pipes. You could also use uh, hydrographs from, from catchment areas directly into the structures themselves. But if I just turn turn these connections on for you that I've already made, and I've specified some outlet controls, some simple orifices for for most of my structures. But then here, because I want to meet that Q30, Q100 and Q1 different discharge rates, I've used a complex um, outfall control here. So that's it. That's my system set up. I'm ready to start having a look at uh, and analyzing this. And if I go here, I can set my criteria. We're wanting to look at flooding so using my 30 year rainfall. And now we've got this great little function validate which will help me check just before I start pressing go and in case nothing happens if I've missed out some crucial information uh, and this will display through a tree manager view exactly what's missing and where I need to go to find it but everything looks okay so I'll, I'll run the analysis now uh, and I'm generating through all of those 30 year return period storms and hopefully in a second we'll get some results so Initially, it's displaying all of my different storage structures uh, for one storm. But actually, I'd like to see how each structure is behaving across all of the 30 year storms. So if I select the all storms function, you'll see now I can view it by each drainage system. So my first area was this T junction of, of porous paving. I'm going to look for all of my 30 year storms. I'm OK. I've not got any uh, any flooding. I'm not encroaching on any of the freeboard there. So that's good. If I select the central porous paving, however, you can see that for some of the storms, I have got a flood risk. And this means I'm encroaching into my freeboard. Porous paving or perhaps. In an inflow. Uh, and then if I. This is all right. And actually, with that central porous car park area, I'm, I'm OK with that uh, for the time being. So I want to consider how much storage I said I was aiming for about 700 cubic meters. If I go to the design report, you can see actually amongst my four structures, I've got a total of 720 cubic meters of storage. Uh, so that's a significant improvement on the amount that Roy's um, had to use and obviously this is fitting in with the natural landscape and it's providing some amenity and it's dealing with the water much closer to the source rather than just having to size one massive pond and outflow control 
at the end. So the most important thing that I need to check now is I said I was using a complex outfall to meet my Q1, Q30, and Q100 rates, but I need to check using the 100-year storm uh, that that is actually uh, correct, and I am okay to do that. So if I go to the 100-year, I've already set up the six-hour winter storm for the 100-year return period. So if I just apply that and click Go, You'll see now I get some results. I have started to get some flood risk in my second swale, but I'm okay with that perhaps because it's a hundred year event and it, I'm not flooding, so it's not discharging away from my site. You can see my max outflow is 16.3 liters per second, lower than my Q100 value of approximately 20 liters per second. But the most important check is this post development runoff volume. And if I go to the phase management, you can see here that my total volume that I'm discharging from a site is now 440 cubic meters below that 650 cubic meters figure, which is saying, yep, it's OK. I can achieve parity, provided I achieve parity to my Q1, Q30, Q100 discharge rates. And that's OK. I'm no longer bound by having to meet Q bar. And from here, you could generate this into a, a phase report for your printouts uh, and this is just an example quick example to show you that using this suds implementation method different structures joined up dealing with the flow closer to those subcatchment areas uh, we can get away with uh, multiple uh, benefits including using less storage providing better amenity and this is actually a quick and simple alternative at the conceptual design stage to the traditional design that Roy's used so without further ado, I'll hand you back to Peter. Thank you, Max, and thank you, Roy. Really enjoyed that. I was carried away with the presentations there. Thanks, guys. So I hope that everyone out there can appreciate that it's quick and easy to establish uh, a highway scheme. Uh, we can export the traditional drainage systems, bring them into micro drainage, and, and either go down that traditional route to satisfy the client, if that's really what they are requiring, but try to encourage them down the sustainable drainage route. And with what Max showed us with MD SEDS, the fact that we can look right back at source and identify opportunities throughout the site to build in this source control. And that would be a better way to go, ideally. And that will certainly satisfy the approving authorities and the new SEDS manual that comes out tomorrow. I'm hoping that people are starting to really think about working with nature and identifying those blue-green corridors at the outset is something that many people are now doing as a matter of course, and I know that that's coming through in a lot of standards globally across the region that we're dealing with. But those scenarios are quite quick and easy to establish, and you have talking points, so you can sit down, discuss with the client, discuss with the approving authorities, and you can always tweak these things to suit and enable you to design with full confidence that you're going to get a quick approval from all stakeholders. So looking ahead over the next month or so, what's happening tomorrow? We have a new SEDS design manual guidance document coming out, the uh, long awaited uh, rewrite. It's only a thousand pages short, so uh, some good bedtime reading if anyone's uh, suffering from insomnia. But it's a really good read. And as I mentioned before, it's establishing or re-establishing the balance between the biodiversity, water quality, amenity, as well as the water quantity side of things. And it's very well illustrated. There is a whole chapter on water quality, and then there are chapters on each of the individual structures. As Max mentioned, the retention requirement of nine minutes within a swale, for example. So we're now potentially being asked to look at the flow through the structures and you can be reassured that MD SEDS is already in place, both for flow through structures, as well as looking at the pollution removal characteristics as well to satisfy that new guidance document. Next week, we have a week of training, micro drainage training, um, followed by the following week with Lude Miller running XP swim training here from the 23rd to the 25th of November. Uh, looking forward to meeting everyone over the next couple of weeks on training. Then the next webinar will be run on the 9th of December. We've had a load of questions coming in, so thanks for sending in the messages, etc. We will be producing a frequently asked question sheet that we'll send out post-webinar, uh, and we'll give you the details on how to log in and register for the next webinar and its content when we've had a chance to digest all of your feedback from this particular one. And really appreciate you joining us. 
We have one final training session before the year end, uh, 14th to 17th of December. So if anyone's looking for training, then do take a look online now because I know that these courses have filled up or, or filling up very quickly. In terms of the products, etc., we do have uh, packs available so you can increase your micro drainage capabilities by adding in the XP Site 3D or the MD sets. You can just email us and we will then action those requests and uh, tell you how you can go about it and how much it would cost, etc. And any questions and comments would be more than welcome. But thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Roy. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. Take care and see you on the 9th of December. Bye for now.